Let's go ahead and start our webinar for today. Welcome. My name is Dr. Rachel Vreeman. I'm a pediatrician and HIV researcher. I'm the chair of the Department of Global Health of the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And we're incredibly happy to welcome back to our COVID and global health focused webinar today, Dr. Aaron Carroll. Dr. Carroll is a nationally recognized research scientist. He leads lots of different research teams. He's a New York Times contributing opinion writer, the author of multiple books on medical myths, including three that we co-authored together. Um, and at the Indiana University School of Medicine, Dr. Carroll is the Associate Dean for Research Mentoring. He's a professor of pediatrics and the Vice President for Faculty Development for the Regan Street Institute. He is also someone that everyone wants to talk about his piece and talk with, I should say. I mean, we like to talk about you too, Aaron. Um, but uh, Aaron, you know, Aaron's pieces for the New York Times routinely are focusing on examining the data related to health and our healthcare systems. Of course, he's been a critical voice as we look at data related to the COVID-19 pandemic. He also has a popular YouTube channel called Healthcare Triage, where he talks about health research and health policy. And his work, um, a lot of his work also looks at information technology to improve pediatric care and healthcare more broadly and health policy. So his wide ranging expertise, I've also been fortunate enough to call Aaron a mentor and friend for a lot of years. And so we're really excited to have him. Aaron was actually our inaugural guest when we launched this webinar series in March, when we were in the midst of the first terrible weeks of the COVID pandemic here in New York City, where I sit. And at that point, he and I were really looking at what comes next and how might we still really beat back this pandemic. It seems a bit crazy to be here in, you know, almost to December, the, the end of November, as we're talking about right now, and looking at where we are. In fact, when we set this up, I didn't know, you know, what we'd be talking about in terms of the election, in terms of where we were with the pandemic and what's happening with health um, broadly. But of course, as I would imagine, um, everyone joining us is aware, you know, we have so much we could talk about health-wise right now, particularly in the United States. We have this horrific second wave of the pandemic, something that you, Erin, predicted back in March when we talked before. We've, many of us had a very different kind of Thanksgiving this year that we've just moved through. We are, of course, still in the middle of this political transition after our presidential election here in the U.S. And um, there's a lot on the horizon when we think about everyone's health. So I guess, you know, where to start, but let me ask sort of like, I guess first, like, how are you? And as you think about the health of our country around us right now, what's your kind of current uh, temperature taking? So the biggest thing that's depressing me, like at the moment, as you were talking just now, was that I bet, and if you went back and played our conversation in March, almost everything that we were recommending would still be the exact same advice as yeah. to what we should be doing now. And it's a massive failure on this country's part that we still have not taken that advice. Yep. And that it's not as if we need new knowledge or new understanding. I mean, the same things that we were asking for in March, the same things that I felt like I was writing about in April and March and May and June, the same column that I wrote to how we could maybe think about starting camp would apply to how we could start school. And we just have not done it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it's people keep asking like, how are you? And, you know, and when I do these kinds of things and it's, if I'm being like totally honest, not good. <laughs> it's been, um, <laughs> you. If, you know, COVID, COVID has been rough, but, uh, you know, like many, many people across the country, I'm not alone in this. It's just touched in ways that were unexpected. My, my father passed away just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were unable to sort of gather for a funeral. My brother managed to catch COVID um, going in and out of the facilities at the end, trying to, to arrange for his care. My mom is in memory care in Las Vegas, and no one has physically seen her since March. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's very difficult to have conversations with someone on FaceTime as um, yeah. their Alzheimer's capacity gets worse. So it's like, it's just horrific. I mean, just terrible. And yet, 
the lack of sort of an organized public response to this has been maddening. Um, in Indiana, where where I live, mm-hmm. you used to live, um, we've we've had a massive surge. So when when I I'm I'm helping to to run IU's COVID response, um, and when we were having real discussions at the highest levels of leadership about whether we could bring students back at the end of August, we were nervous because cases were surging to you know a thousand a day, which was panicking people. That's quaint now. Um, we're regularly blowing past 5,000 a day now, surging sometimes to 8,000 cases a day. So the numbers we're seeing are just nothing like what we've seen before. And yet, you know, the response is somewhat of a shrug. Uh, we're seeing our healthcare systems get overwhelmed again, um, or they're at least headed in that direction. Deaths are reaching an all time high uh, in Indiana. And yet, uh, you know, we are still restaurants and bars going at full capacity uh we haven't we have had some schools shut down which i'm sure we'll touch on and then i cannot fathom why that is our go-to response Uh, but this is still maddening that that in in november when everyone was saying november was going to be terrible so many people are are shocked and surprised that november has been terrible Um, and so it is Hopefully we will get better at this. I mean, I think I think vaccines are coming and vaccines will help, but that's not going to make a difference in January or February or certainly not in December. Um, and it will help frontline workers and it'll help people in nursing homes potentially. Uh, but lots of the, the morbidity and mortality that we're seeing are not in those groups. Uh, and it will take time for us to get vaccines to the general population, especially it'll take much time until there's a real population-wide effect and people have got to do better until then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I hear you. And first, let me, let me say how sorry I am, of course, for the losses in your, in your family. What an incredibly difficult time. And, you know, I, it, it is interesting as I reflect too, you know, as someone who for the last 15 years, as you know, has done work in the HIV epidemic and is accustomed to kind of in, in certain ways, tragic, terrible numbers and, and things this this year and these numbers and the way in which there has been so little by way of effective response to this, you know, this massive infectious disease crisis has been, um, yeah, has, has just, it continues to be over and over again, almost impossible to process, I feel like. Even, even for, you know, people like us who are really accustomed to numbers and data and research, it's, it's, still, it's still overwhelming to, to consider that way. You know, I wondered, um, maybe, you know, I, I think you probably do a better job than anyone else I know about explaining some of the complexities of how the American healthcare system and policies related to our healthcare work or don't work um, to to really address you know health inequities and and some of the the critical public health challenges that we face you know and I think as we look at the the American failure to to adequately respond to this pandemic and and we think about you know how in fact our health policy, our insurance systems, the American systemic racism, all of these these things come together to put us into this place. I wondered if you could kind of give almost like a a primer, a a background of like what some of these things are that have made it so that those things we've recommended that that where the science points to, you know, masks, testing, PPE, like appropriate closures, like what is it about the things in our systems that, that have, not let the that work like why are we here <laughs> oh man <laughs> you know, write, i like to start you know, with easy, a little you great little, great little on that on yeah monday <laughs> so i first of all we should be clear that that the you know the the pandemic did not cause these issues but it's it's exposed them in ways and to more people perhaps than have ever seen them before. Uh, I think I wrote a piece, I wanna say like in March, April that almost was entirely on just how this exposed the, the silliness of deductibles. Um, that, that why would we have a system where we increase cost sharing at the beginning of the year in January, February and March when we're desperately trying to get people to like go get tested. Um, 
And until we pass laws saying, well, testing will be covered and this and that with no cost sharing and everything else, we, we basically say, oh, if you want to go get a flu test or if you want to go get health care or if you want to go even get a COVID test or get health care for COVID, you're going to have to pay more in arguably the beginning of winter. That's insanity. But that's that's our system. And it's not in any way tailored to you know, what might be wrong with people. Some countries, you know, are much more nuanced with cost sharing. They use it like a scalpel. We use it like a sledgehammer. It's just, we just, we want to dissuade all healthcare, not unnecessary health not care or not, you know, healthcare for healthy people, but just all healthcare. Um, on top of that, you know, tons of people are uninsured. Uh, tons of people don't have uh, insurance, and it was not quite clear how they would get care or how they would pay for it. Healthcare is not free. I mean, we have this myth in the United States that oh, anyone can go and get, you know, cared for in an emergency room. That care is not free. You just are not going to be denied that care. Um, there are tons of stories of collection agencies going after people, you know, forever to try to collect that. And that, of course, insurance only covers you, or like, you know, that guarantee of care covers you for the emerging period, not necessarily for hospitalizations, for ongoing care, for everything else. Uh, on top of a broken healthcare system, I mean, there are just massive disparities in the way, you know, in structural racism, in the way that, that everything is set up in the United States. Uh, you know, we, we argue that people should, you know, stay home and shelter in place, and yet there are no mechanisms for them to have food delivered. Uh, there are no mechanisms for them for people to avoid public transportation or cramped bad housing or uh, the fact that they won't get paid if they don't show up for their jobs. And we still have Congress who is uh, seemingly unable to, to pass any kind of financial security to tell people while you follow the things we're demanding you do to to comply with public health guidance, we will make sure you don't go bankrupt and otherwise aren't penalized. There's no protection for that at all. Nor does that get at even the structural racism and inequalities in how we provide care, how we treat people, how we diagnose them, how we uh, provide for them in any number of ways in terms of uh, how housing and school and transportation. And I, I could list the many, many, many other ways in which this is not set up fairly. But we've seen that this has disproportionately hit communities of color, um, that they have suffered far more than, than other communities have uh, in, in, in every step of the way uh, in terms of how we provide care, how we uh, resource people, how we cover them, how we treat them, even if they do show up for care, uh, how, we, how we take care of them, how the system is set up to, to, to penalize them at every step of the way. And just, I think in general too, and this makes me sad, is just I, I've, I've listened for the last decade um, how people are very much against the idea that why should I have to pay for someone else's care? Um, as if that's not what insurance is, private insurance is anyway. I mean, when I pay my insurance premium, that money goes to the people who are sick. If I'm healthy, I don't get anything. I'm paying for other people's care. This, the healthy are always paying for the sick. For some reason, we just we just don't like that. And when we think about it too hard, we're, we're not good at it. Um, and the idea that I will care for someone else, that I will wear a mask to protect others, because that's what masks generally are for, that I will sacrifice personally so that others maybe can have something that I don't mm -hmm. is somehow repellent to too many people. Um, I, I, I know I keep bringing up pieces, but that's somehow organized. But I know I, I wrote a piece recently talking about like, you know, there's all of our actions are collective. Um, each action that we choose to choose safety over danger puts a little bit of public good in a pot. Um, and so we should not only consider what we're willing to give up to protect ourselves, but like, what am I willing to give up to protect others? I can give up a lot because of my the many benefits that I have in my life. Um, I can have food delivered. I can avoid public transportation. Um, I get to work in my house. Uh, at the moment. And so, like, I'm willing to give up a lot of things that I wouldn't otherwise get, because I know that that might allow some people who don't have the same benefits and options uh, to be able to do more safely. Uh, that's, that is not somehow translated from leadership on down. Um, and in too many communities, that's not just part of the, 
the, the public discussion. Um, we're all in this together, and yet too much of the discussion is about my freedoms, my rights, um, my wanting what I want right now, give it to me, uh, as opposed to what might we all collectively, you know, have to give up so that others might get stuff. And for some reason, that that just isn't, I want to believe that's American, but it doesn't often feel like it is at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it has been so um, both like interesting and tragic and also for me often infuriating to like, to see how these, how these deeply held beliefs emerge in ways that I didn't like fully understand the way that they were there like, across, across um, broad groups. And even too, you know, to consider like so much of what I see right now is that rather than putting clear, you know, science-based guidelines in place for the things where we're gonna say, okay, we are gonna protect people in these ways. Like we're gonna make this, you know, the, the plan. We're, we're kind of relying on, we're very much relying on this like piecemeal thing of like, okay, we're gonna guilt people into trying to, to do this. We're not gonna offer you any real practical incentives or solutions for your lost income or your, you know, how you're gonna feed your family or, or live in these ways. And we're not even like really going to make it clear what, you know, what we think is necessary because you, you don't have a consistent message of like, okay, everybody wear masks or like everybody, you know, we're going to follow these criteria for closing things. And I know, I know I've heard it multiple times from people who are very well educated, who, you know, really do want to follow the science where they're like, oh, well, if the state has this, you know, thing open or these are going, it must be okay. Like, we must be safe enough well, doing this because it's open. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, honestly, like, even this last week is such a great example where we were like saying, like, it is absolutely positively unsafe for you to get together with 10 relatives in your home. But hey, if you can afford to make a reservation in a restaurant, then you can get together with 10 of your relatives there with a hundred other people. And that's totally fine. Like, but you have to be able to re be resourced to pay for that. And I'm sure there was an upcharge on Thanksgiving, but somehow that was okay, if not condoned, but doing it in your own house is like, now you're taking other, you don't care about other people. And that kind of like bizarre, inconsistent messaging turns off a lot of people and it's it's, it's not science-based i mean we all know why they're doing it but it, it it really does send the wrong message and it's hard it's hard to get very angry i mean i'm trying so hard in fact i just turned in a column today on how like we've got to stop you know shaming um and we've yeah. got to stop making this yeah. about getting angry at people as if like because it's too easy to do and we are in this together and it's very hard sometimes to recognize that there's a certain amount of privilege about being to follow about being able to follow the rules and that to many there are ways to buy out of the restrictions if you can but otherwise you're expected to just suffer in silence and that that's it's just not going to work yeah yeah and it, you know and it really brings up you know if we look across of course like public health history like shame has never been effective in this strategy like abstinence only not having sex like that has that has not worked <laughs> that, that doesn't work you know it it doesn't work it, you know, it doesn't work to shame people out of smoking. It's not like, it, it, it's just not an effect in the whole, um, you know, considering of course, like the use of opioids and things like shame, shame doesn't work. <laughs> it, it doesn't work and it's not gonna work here. And it just continues to divide further. And to what you're saying in terms of like, when we, when we put out these inconsistent messages, things are already so fragmented in terms of who people are willing to listen to and what they believe and what they think about you know conspiracies and and what's happening that if if they you know if we put out even more inconsistencies it just undermines the whole thing further i think see i'm with you let's all right <laughs> maybe this is more positive i'm not sure but i'd love to talk to you about vaccines so of course sure. Um, you know, more studies were, were more, you know, data is coming out from Moderna today. They're applying to the FDA. Pfizer already has their FDA application in for, for vaccine approval. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about what you think, you know, if you could wave the Aaron magic wand for vaccine rollout, like what should this look like? 
but also like to push you on what you were bringing up, like what about our issues of inequity and the massive disparities we're seeing in this? How might we consider a vaccine rollout that both moves things out efficiently and and quickly, but also how can we how can we better address some of these inequities too? Well, first of all, like I mean, it is an unmitigated scientific triumph. I the idea that you know, in like a year or less, less than a year, let's be honest, uh, we've gone from like a completely novel illness to a to multiple potential working vaccines is just unfathomable. And if you'd asked me six months ago, I would would have said it's it's any vaccine that was going to come out in 2020. And I'm sorry, in 2020 was going to be crap. Um, and I was wrong. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing because I mean, the results they're posting look phenomenal. Yep. Having said that, it's also we we should not get to sort of irrational exuberance of of you know when we talk about you know Moderna's hoping to have twenty million doses to begin with, knowing that it takes two doses. We're talking about ten million people, and we've got to know that if if you know the CDC gets its act together and creates a uh, reasonable scheme for how these should be distributed, probably they're going to go first to frontline workers, healthcare workers, people that are, you know, really at high risk, then to probably nursing homes, um, and then to other people at incredibly high risk, which is mostly going to be the elderly and people with severe chronic conditions. We have way more than 10 million of those people I just described. So it is very likely that, you know, vaccines will have to be in some way prioritized. Now, having seen inside the healthcare system, they're working. I mean, it's impressive. I think there are like schemes being set up across the country to make sure that vaccines get to healthcare workers incredibly quickly. I mean, we're talking just a couple of weeks. So I, that's impressive. Now, how well it goes off is a whole other thing, but that is still impressive and it is good. The, the bigger questions though, are how thoughtful and equitable will we be once we get past those highest priority groups. And you will hear my cynicism and skepticism again, uh, because traditionally we've been so bad at this that I have no good reason to believe that without massive intervention, this will be the first time we overcome, you know, massive structural racism and disparities and everything else that comes into play. Um, I think that there will definitely be people jockeying for uh, positioning. There will also be you know, ham-handed and, you know, half-hearted attempts to reach communities that are already mistrustful of government and science and the healthcare system in general and may not be looking to get the vaccine. And that may be a convenient excuse for us to say, fine, we'll, we'll wait and, and you'll get the vaccine later. Unfortunately, those groups in the Venn diagrams often overlap with the groups that are likely at higher risk and need it the most. Um, and so I hope we do a better job of making distribution equitable and fair, uh, but I don't know. Of course, in my world, being like responsible for university, my, you know, the school is incredibly optimistic thinking like, oh, we're all going to be saved. And I'm like, I got to tell you, young 20 something year olds are probably back of the line in terms of prioritization schemes because they're the lowest at risk. So will this make a difference on like college campuses? Probably not for spring semester. Um, and I don't even know how much of a difference it's going to make for America in the spring, because even if we protect healthcare workers and people in nursing homes, which is an unequivocal good, don't get me wrong. Um, it doesn't mean that like the rest, that they're, like societally, we've reached herd immunity and now we can strip off masks and go about a normal business. I think life in the beginning of 2021 is gonna look very much like life right now. And too many people are waiting for salvation from without. If we don't do the things we've been saying you gotta do for months and months and months, we will still have a very rough winter um, that we'll look back on and think it was a tragic missed opportunity to do a lot of good. Yeah. Can you talk about, you know, how I, I think there is um, for many of us, it's so hard to translate the idea of risk into our own lives often in terms of the practical decisions that we're making, even if we think like we're rational, you know, that we're rational thinking about this and how we're weighing risks and benefits and so on. 
Can you talk a little bit, and I know you've written about this, which is why I'm asking you, of course, but like what it looks like to consider risk. So for, you know, if we're thinking about this again, continuing into a, you know, a longer haul into the beginning of 2021, spring of 2021 and so on, like what it looks like to think about risk that way. And with that, how those calculations may or may not change as we consider the vaccines. So I think part of it is we have a very hard time grasping the difference between personal risk and and risk at a public level. Mm -hmm. um, and often I, I, I talk about this often in the opposite direction with like nutrition guidelines mm -hmm. where we make these grand sweeping proclamations because it makes a huge difference at a public health level, but in an individual level, it makes almost no difference at all. And since when we talk about nutrition, really the risk is to you, it's very hard to convince people personally to take on risk that is a public health level. This is almost the opposite. Sure. Most individuals, if we're being honest, are still a pretty low risk from COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, the vast, vast, vast majority of Americans are not going to have not gotten this, and even when they do, the vast majority do okay. What the problem is that at a public health level, it's horrific. I mean, just you know, hundreds of thousands of dead, millions of cases, probably millions hospitalized. It's terrible. Um, but at an individual level, it's very hard to get people to understand that that while it may be a little risk for you, all of that adds up to an enormous amount. My my favorite example of this is, um, it was a study years and years and years ago about when varicella first came out, the varicella vaccine first came out. Uh, so, you know, we only vaccinate kids one and up, um, but we're not for the most part worried about kids four, five, six years old. We're worried about babies. Because um, when babies get varicella, it's incredibly dangerous, but we can't vaccinate them. But in the first few years after vaccinating kids one and up, the number of babies who died from varicella dropped to like, I mean, literally zero. Um, where, you know, that's, that's what we're doing it for. We vaccinate often to protect those who cannot protect themselves. Um, and that's what we're doing again with this vaccine. We're individually, you know, we're, we're probably decreasing risks for ourselves personally a very, very tiny amount. But if we're all willing to do it, we will save other people yeah. who need it. Um, and that, that is not how we sell vaccines. Like we often <laughs> tell parents like, you know, you, you want to get vaccinated because you don't want your kid to get measles. You don't want your kid to get pertussis. You don't want... You know, you're, and then and then when they run the numbers in their head, they're like, the likelihood of my kid getting any of these diseases is infinitesimal. Why should I bother? That's not why we vaccinate. We vaccinate not just for that reason, but to protect those that can't protect themselves. It's a societal good. Um, and just like uh, it, it is for those, it would be for this. We will build up herd immunity and wind up making it safe for the people who are at highest risk for for coming down with COVID and having a you know a, a bad outcome, which which of course could be any of us, um, but we know who's at highest risk. We can identify them. We should vaccinate to protect others in the same way, though, that we should do a lot of these other measures to protect others. But there's almost no discussion of that. It feels like at a leadership level, it's about protecting yourself um, because we think that's how to appeal to people. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know that that's. Uh, the best way. Of course, you know, protecting yourself is true for some things. Right. Sexually transmitted disease, you're, you are protecting yourself. Um, you know, granted, you're also providing some societal good, but there's a definite personal outcome that you can measure. Uh, it doesn't translate like that with, with these kinds of diseases, and especially not with usually vaccine prevented illnesses. Uh, but we have to do, we have to do a better job about, uh, about how making people appreciate different kinds of risk and why it's important to understand the differences and, and the nuances of them. So actually before, before I um, ask Aaron another question, let me mention to people who are joining us that we very much welcome um, your questions and we'll, we'll keep talking for a little bit more, but we'll, we'll move to those as we uh, uh, approach towards the end of the hour. Please feel free to type questions into the question and answer box in the meantime, and we'll we'll look at those. So wanted to welcome people to do that, I, I forgot. Um, so I guess thinking about um, what you were saying, Erin, in terms of you know, what leadership has or has not been appealing to and how we're trying to balance these risks, and also, of course, considering these rollouts, 
what do you what do you think should be or might be the first uh, steps that the new Biden Harris COVID focused task force take? And and when do, you know? So what do you what do you what do you think they might be doing? And how um, how soon do you think we might see any significant impact from from that? I'm curious for your thoughts on that. Well, I think partially. I mean, I mean, some of it is is low hanging fruit, just model behavior. I mean, just you know, put on a mask, you know, avoid groups and gatherings, don't engage in behavior you're trying to tell other people to avoid. <laughs> Start strengthening, again, trust in science and facts and, you know, data and research again. Um, and, you know, a commitment to the, the epidemiology, you know, the playbook. We, the, none of what we were talking about in March is like, we didn't invent this out of thin air. Like, how to respond to a pandemic is reasonably well known. Some countries were doing it well. We just don't seem to be willing to engage in that. Um, so that is now, I think the biggest thing is, unfortunately, that it's going to also require Congress, uh, you know, yeah. putting out, we, we keep asking states to do stuff, um, but states can't print money, they cannot run deficits. And so much of what we're asking for requires massive amounts of resources. Uh, and they're not necessarily resourced to do it. So open the spigots, uh, you got to pay for you know, if you're asking restaurants and bars to close, which we probably should, you got to tide them over. Um, if we're telling them for public good, we have to make sure they don't go out of business. Uh, we want schools to exist, massively fund them to be safe, you know, give them the resources to do it. I keep, you know, it's not just that I'm saying be open school, it's open school safely. Some districts are able to do this, many are not, and it's not, it's not, you know, it's very obvious which ones can and cannot, or because they are resourced to do so, resource the rest of them to do this properly. Um, get more teachers in the short term. Let, allow us to de-densify classrooms. Pay hotels to open up ballrooms to, to turn them into classes. You know, we could we could be very novel about this, but we're just not willing to do it. I also think we need massive, massive investments in, in testing. Uh, we still, uh, cannot do nearly the amount of testing that we do. I mean, at IU, like we've spent, you know, significant amount of time this year, like building up labs where we're doing a fairly large amount of testing just within IU's uh, walls for 120,000 constituents. The state is incapable of, of doing that, not because, you know, they, they lack money, but they just lack sort of resources and will and guidance and the, the leadership to pull that off. Uh, but but accomplishing a lot of this is just resources and will. And that's what's got to come from the top, uh, both both the, the, the money that's necessary to accomplish the things we need to accomplish. Um, and then, you know, sort of the leadership and will to, to say that it can be done and then to do it. Uh, you've seen, I think, some states do this better than others, but there's too much of an adversarial relationship often between mayors and public health officials and governors and Congress and the president, and that's just got to stop. Uh, we, are, we are all in this together. This is not a partisan issue, uh, and it is absolutely tragic uh, that, has, that it has become that. Uh, but, I mean, I, I, the Biden-Harris plan is reasonable. Um, it's just, I, I'm only concerned for how much they can get through Congress and how quickly they can get going, because January 20th is still pretty far away. Yeah, there, there's a question in the box actually that kind of relates into what you were just talking about in terms of thinking about like what seats can do, what they can't do, and so on, which which I think might be um, interesting to to look at so so you know related to um, of course you know how COVID has exposed the inequities and deficiencies of our payment system in healthcare. Uh, the question is brought up that in New York there's a Medicare for All Act that has some renewed momentum with the Democrats, um, where where they have won a veto-proof supermajority in the New York State Senate. And so the question is, you know, what are your thoughts on these kinds of state level attempts at Medicare for all and what might, you know, state academic health centers like like ours at Mount Sinai and so on do to support its passage to me to me it ties into to this question of like okay, you know, as you were saying like at IU like right, we're trying to ramp up testing like here are things we can do in our various domains 
what do these state efforts look like? What, how can we support them? And yet also, you know, what, what do we need more broadly? I think Medicare for all is a perfectly reasonable way to, to achieve universal healthcare coverage. And if you look over my writing for the last, God, now you gotta go back 15 years, I have been more at times more in pot, you know, more favorable towards single payer and at times less favorable to single payer. And where I where I have, the reason is because I think it's a perfectly reasonable way to have a universal health care system. And if the United States wants to pass it, I will not stand in its way at all. Where I take a breath is that I think there are better healthcare systems in the world that are not single payer systems. And we could totally consider those too. Um, you know, Switzerland's is entirely very tightly regulated, you know, private health insurance, mostly nonprofit, birth to death, not tied to jobs. They have phenomenal outcomes. France's is sort of a sort of quasi a single payer baseline with a private component overlay that like, you know, 75, 80% of people get usually through their job. Um, Phenomenal. Um, England is, you know, completely socialist, government run, government run and implemented healthcare. Canada is single payer. I sometimes wonder if we fixate on single payer because it's the one that's right up north of us. Uh, but there are lots of viable options for achieving universal health care with great outcomes. I don't know that single payer gets the best outcomes. It is perhaps the most equitable, um, and it can sometimes be cheaper uh, because it provides a single payer mechanism to drive down costs, uh, which is usually not popular with the healthcare system. And some would argue might have some uh, impact on innovation. But again, I, I, I'm not against it. I am, <laughs> all of them are better than what we've got. Pick, I do not care. Like we, we did an article, one of my favorite things we ever did was uh, uh, Austin and I wrote a, it was, it was like March of like, I wanna say like 2017, we did a bracket system uh, in the New York Times where we picked eight healthcare systems. And then we like put them head to head in like an NCAA tournament kind of thing. And readers got to vote on it online. And if I remember correctly, Switzerland won, and it came in second to France. Um, and again, Switzerland is not a not a single payer system, uh, but they're all better than the United States. In, and I would take any one of them. So if a state can figure out a way to do it with a Medicare for all type thing, I am thrilled. If a state can figure out a way to do it with a you know widened benefit, widened Bennett back in the day you know, totally regulated private health insurance, birth to death, all of us in one big exchange with massive subsidies uh, for people at the lower end of the social economic spectrum, I'm all for that. Uh, if we can find another way, I'm fine with that too. Uh, but our system is not great. Uh, and so uh, I, I support all kinds of state level innovation that really does legitimately try to improve access, quality or cost. Yeah, totally with you. So let's let's talk about schools. <laughs> I mean, well, we can we can talk about ideas of you know shutdown, closures, safety more broadly. But um, you know, of course, as we consider you know as we consider these months ahead, and and again, I know you've been writing about this and thinking about this. You and I are both pediatricians, of course, um, as well as the parents of children. Uh, and what you know what as we consider this question of what needs to shut down and again like the schools seem to be so you know quickly on this list how do we how do we handle that i guess my first part would be like maybe you can kind of provide your summary of why you don't think schools should be the first thing to to be shutting down i should know you know we're i'm again sitting here in new york city um a little over a, a week ago, you know, as our test positivity rates went a little bit higher, the New York City public schools all immediately shut um, by the mayor's the mayor's um, agreement. And at the same time, limited indoor dining, bars remain open, people can go to gyms. I mean, we've we've been we've had pretty significant restrictions in New York, but still, these things remain open. Schools closed. Um, now we did hear yesterday that that the schools are going to be reopening in, in about a week. Um, they're they're saying I know there, there's been of course a lot of backlash about this, but you know this is 
this to me is, is such a massive issue of how people are weighing or not weighing the risks and benefits of school closure. Why aren't schools being prioritized? And you know, with that, the incredible risks and long-term risks to kids that were, that were neglecting when we so quickly close schools. So tell us what you think about school closures here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, I'm not ever surprised uh, because of course kids are at, they don't vote and it, they don't make money. School, public schools don't make money. So, you know, it doesn't hurt theoretically when people are thinking the first line is it doesn't hurt the economy. Of course, it massively hurts the economy um, because all the people who have kids all of a sudden can't work as easily as they used to. Um, but, you know, we should be again scientific and thinking about if if case. First of all, again, where'd you pick three percent? Indiana's like it, you know, eleven percent, and my kids are still going to school. Um, so one, where's the number come from? Uh, it's it's difficult to say. So, but even on top of that, you want to close down the highest risk activities. There's a reason that you know we're limiting large gatherings. It's because they account for super spreader events. Uh, but if you look at where most transmission seems to occur, it's in public gathering spaces. It's in bars, it's in restaurants, it's at weddings, it's at gatherings. It was, I don't, you know, unfortunately places where people were indoor singing together. That's where a lot of spread happens. Um, spread does not happen, it does seems, inside schools when they're well managed. Now, when they're not well managed, there's a phenomenal documentation of this and a good article about Israeli school when it opened up, there was massive spread, but they did everything wrong. Like they shut the windows and they they had kids like sharing devices and sitting in like close groups. Don't do that. Dedensify, <laughs> spread out, wear masks. My kid's school system is doing a great job of this. You know, my, my daughter and my son, they're in hybrids. They go every other day. They're in high school. Um, they have no close contacts during the day. They spend, you know, almost no time within six feet of another individual. Even they've opened up every possible place you could think of to have lunch so that no one is sitting at the same table as someone else, even when they eat. Um, they stagger the class times. Everybody is masked. They've de-densified to classrooms of like 13, which is crazy given that the, the, the school has usually 5,000 kids in it. Um, and so it's that's how it's done right. And there've been very few transmissions. Now, have kids gotten it? Sure. But almost all in like sleepovers and parties and and sporting events, not at school. Have teachers gotten it? Sure. At bars and at restaurants and at other places they go. There's not a lot of evidence that schools have been the major place of transmission. And given that, we should shut down first the places where transmission is occurring. But for some reason, the knee jerk reaction is school first. I'm sure I don't have to tell most of the people on this call, like, you know, school is also pretty necessary. Uh, it's it's an essential service. And for some reason, we're not viewing it as such. Uh, kids are falling behind in education. There's huge disparities. Uh, great article, again, in the New York Times, I think from the, the spring, that documented that something like one in three kids, like we're not even attending school in the spring when we shut down, especially in poorer areas of cities. Uh, there, we're not resourced to do distance learning. We uh, Kids are already falling behind. Th those who are already at risk are even more likely to fall behind. Uh, that has lifelong consequences in terms of the ability to graduate and therefore get jobs and everything else that comes after it. Uh, you know, we can close down a bar and we can give people cash to tide them over. We cannot hand kids a check. Uh, and say, yeah, sorry about that missed year of school. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, and so if we're gonna, if we, it gets so bad that we have to shut down everything, maybe we also have to shut down schools, but school should be last. And for some reason, it's often first. And I, again, as we discussed at the beginning, the optics of, yeah, you can still go to the bar and the hairdresser and the manicurist and, you know, get a massage and, and, you know, and still eat out all a big group at a restaurant, but kids can't go to school. There's, there's no good scientific evidence for that at all. 
Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. You know, and I, I we um, we just had an, uh, an international pediatric HIV meeting, and there was there was also a lot of time and session devoted to COVID related work in kids because it's you know international virologists who are focused on on children and and you know just as you're saying, like yes, of course, kids can get COVID. You know, a very small number of of kids have gotten you know very sick from it or even died. But we have to balance these risks and the risks compared to, you know, a year or two years of not learning, of not having interaction, the incredible inequities that are just made worse by this are all, you know, are all very much um, against this, especially when we see these, these very clear examples of how keeping schools open in the right ways has worked, has been safe, you know, it has has been a success and, and it looks like that globally. Um, let's talk, since we are a global health group, let's talk a little bit about global health. And actually I see there are two um, questions that people have put in that are that are tied to some global health questions. So let, let's start um, with those and then we can we can keep talking as well. So one is around the question of travel and, you know, what, what do we, what might we say would be things that need to happen before travel to other countries might be a reasonable idea? And, and how do we think about travel to more remote places versus urban places? How do we, you know, consider ourselves as, you know, how not to be a human smallpox blanket, but essentially like, you know, how can we, especially as Americans with a very poorly controlled pandemic, um, you know, not be vectors carrying COVID elsewhere as well is I think the, a critical determinant in this. Thoughts on, thoughts on travel? Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, this again, is it's going to be, I'm hopeful, very consistent with what I was saying before. So, look, air travel in general is probably, for an individual, mm -hmm. safe. Um, but my, where it falls apart, and where I'm a little mistrustful of it, is I don't trust the person in the seat behind me waking <laughs> up that morning and, and like ha not feeling well and being, screw it, I already got this ticket, I made my plans, I'm going. Um, and that's where it falls apart in the sense that like, we're not necessarily all Americans taking this as seriously as we should. Yeah. But I would also say it depends why you're traveling. Mm -hmm. I am choosing not to travel mm -hmm. so that others can travel safely because the only reason I need to travel right now is for vacationing or for business reasons that are really not that necessary because everything I'm doing at this point can be over Zoom. So look, and I'm putting my money where my mouth is, I didn't go home for a funeral. Um, it's just like, it's not necessary. It wasn't going to be safe. When I got there, it was not gonna be, you know, a real family get together. And so it was like, I'm not traveling. But many of you on this call, travel for completely legitimate work reasons. You are necessary overseas in ways that I am not, and most Americans are not. And therefore, in a reasonably thoughtful society, the rest of us would not travel so that you could do so safely. Mm -hmm. I think there are, I tell people all the time, if you must travel, if you have legitimate reasons for air travel right now, it's probably pretty safe. I don't, most people don't. Yeah. Vacationing is not uh, in the scheme of things on those things. So. Th that's, first of all, let's be honest, most, a lot of countries that you might be traveling to are legitimately doing reasonably well at this, if not better than we are. The idea is somehow that international travel is grossly unsafe because we're leaving the safe confines of the United States. <laughs> yeah. What? Like, where, where, where are they going? Like, I live in Indiana. It is on fire here. So I don't know, you know, we're more worried about, you know, people coming here than, than arguably like, you know, us being at risk if we go elsewhere. So I'm not turned off by international travel any more than I am domestic travel. Granted, you know, it's a longer period of time, but if I had to travel, I'd, I'd literally sit like this, I'd wear the mask, I'd forego the beverage service, and I would, you know, hunker down and use hand sanitizer a lot and probably be just fine. Uh, but I, I would I'd say, you know, weigh the purposes of your visit. Or, or why you're traveling. If it's for completely legitimate, non otherwise doable reasons, it's probably pretty safe. I just wish everyone made that risk calculation and we didn't always view things binary as like it's safe or it's unsafe. Right. If the, if the benefits outweigh the risks, it's probably worth it. 
Uh, but but those are not the same. That's not the same calculation for everybody. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. You know, and I'm reminded in in some of our um, medical myth busting about you know we've we've looked of course at like the myths of like how you always get sick on an airplane and those things and what it actually reveals when you look at it is that the air filtration systems on airplanes and this is only even more so true you know this year are incredibly good <laughs> like they fully exchange the air every two minutes and the air that they're bringing in from a higher altitude is very sterile and and so on and I've been reminded of that of course as we've like heard airline executives try to reassure people about, you know, the safety of travel and everything they're doing, spacing, the answers are very, you know, and I'm very supportive of that. But yeah, like, as you said, the still the risks there of, you know, why other people are deciding or not deciding are, are I think, a, a concern to really think about in that, because of course, it isn't any risk. You know, that being said, too, I think the other in my purview is like doing these calculations, I think it is really important to consider the quarantine on the other side of where you would be traveling. And really, especially if you're going to a place where you would be a burden on that healthcare system and you are likely to be the most, you're the most, you're the highest risk. You're the person maybe bringing that virus with you. Like you must quarantine. You must quarantine strictly, not just like, oh, I'm not going to go, you know, gather with 20 people, but like real quarantine. Um, right, absolutely. And I think the countries where we've seen, you know, them absolutely shut down their new cases are in places where where people are, you know, really in many ways mandated to quarantine like this, but are are quarantined. Which, all of which is not to say, like, I don't think travel restrictions are, you know, by any means the be all and end all here. Like, obviously, the United States has lots of other problems with this, but I think there are, are things we can do in that. Um, so another question, um, kind of moving us back to vaccines, but also really thinking about the equity challenges that we were talking about and the issues for vaccine distribution. The question, you know, there's, of course, a global issue with inequity in access to the vaccine as well, um, that, of course, you know, rich countries can buy more of the vaccine before it's produced. Do you have any ideas on how we might address these inequities globally? And, you know, are there ways, uh, you know, do we see anything from the incoming Biden administration where they might be addressing some of that global concern, um, you know, thinking about essentially like rich countries like the U.S. sucking up vaccines before anybody else it's, is kind of how I It's funny it. because I, you know, I most often get, get this question not between sort of rich countries and non-rich countries, but just the United States and everybody else. And the first thing I always say is like, first thing I'm always like, these, you know, most vaccine companies are international companies. Like they're not beholden to the United States. They're producing these drugs like in Europe and then flying them here. Europe is like, lots of countries are going to get this vaccine. So even when like some of these companies say they've got 100 million doses, that's not 100 million for the United States. That's 100 million for the world. And we're not getting it all, regardless of what politicians think. I have a number of good friends who work for pharmaceutical companies, and they all seem to be like, I don't know why people think the United <laughs> States is getting everything, but you're right. Probably rich countries are going to get the lion's share. I, I have heard nothing mm -hmm. out of any politician in the United States about how do we make sure that, uh, you know, lower resourced countries get their fair share of vaccines. So no, not even in the, it's not a Trump versus Biden thing. I haven't heard it from any, I mean, I, I have heard tons of, you know, we need to get it for Americans and what we need to do. Um, and I've heard some politicians talk about making sure it's equitably distributed in the United States, but no, um, I wish I could tell you that, that I heard a lot of uh, leadership in America talking about this is a global issue, but no. Um, you know, and I, I've even heard stories, and I never know if they're anecdotal or not, about how some countries are like, yeah, get the United States more vaccine because they think we're all going to die um, because we're like so hard hit that they feel bad for us, which is just so ironic. I don't even know what to do anymore. Um, and I don't know if that's true or not, but no, this is not... <sighs> This is not our strength in general, um, but certainly in the midst of this pandemic, it does not not seem to be anywhere we're shining. Yeah, you know, and I also I was thinking about this earlier when we were talking about vaccine rollout as well. In terms of really high risk populations, I worry a lot about the populations of people who are incarcerated as well, which you know would really be a, a very high risk group in the United States, but where 
I, you know, frankly, un tragically would be surprised if we appropriately prioritize, you know, incarcerated persons um, based on their risk level, because of course the risk level is really high, but how, you know, yeah. we as a, a country would, would, you know, show appropriate um, valuing of their lives um, when, when at high risk, I, I'm, you know, miserably pessimistic about, about that. I would be shocked if you're wrong. Yeah. It's like, I'd be love to be shocked. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're correct in that that will be a very high risk, but politically fraught for some uh, group to prioritize. And probably that's going to be another tragic way we respond to this. You know, I've, I'm curious to, to hear your opinion um, when we think about some of the agencies and also global groups that typically we've looked to for, you know, health guidance and, and research in this. Obviously, um, you know, very publicly, the, the United States has left the World Health Organization in the midst of this pandemic. And those of us in global health, I would say, you know, overall, very much <laughs> like hope that 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 would be something that we're remedying in the new in the new administration that, you know, well, certainly, you know, we we hope that the World Health Organization, like any of our organizations would get better and better at how we move forward in global health, we very much want the United States to be part of that. I think we've also seen some real um, alterations over the last few years, but then especially this year in how the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC within the United States is viewed, how they're able to operate or not able to operate, what has come or has not come from them. I'd be, I'd be curious about your thoughts on the landscape related to these organizations. Like, do you, do you think in the next year we're going to see, for example, a different CDC emerging as we move forward with this? Do you, or have we fundamentally just broken trust with, I, mean, it's, I, I say this like with like a heartbreaking, I, I, you and I both know, respect, love people who are deeply invested in trying to, you know, absolutely do the very best job possible from within the, the CDC or who have been part of it at different times. But I just feel like we're in such a, also a strange place with these, organizations right now. Thoughts? <laughs> I, I think it's going to take time um, for the CDC to come back. I think that they've unfortunately, um, from external reasons, been sidelined, but also internally um, squandered a fair amount of goodwill. Like I, there's a part of me and I understand the realities of the world, but there's a part of me that feels like there should have been many more vocal resignations uh, in that about how this went. I'd like to believe that if I was part of an organization that all of a sudden just decided to like say the opposite of what I believed in, I'd be like, yeah, I'm out of here. Like it's just not, but that's also comes from a place of privilege that I recognize. So I'm, I'm not going to blame or shame or do anything else, but I do think it will take time um, to come back. But I also think that, that some of this uh, is political. Like I, I have written a lot of columns and many chapters of books um, railing against the WHO and their classification of what foods cause cancer or not. Um, because if you look up the WHO of the like thousand and one things they've investigated, they've found one or two that they say this doesn't cause cancer. Like everything causes cancer. So I'm like, come on guys, like uh, there's a, there's causes cancer and then there's causes cancer and you gotta be better at this. But, but I poke, you know, I poke them because I love them. I poked them, you know, the AAP, because I love it. I poked the CDC because I want them to be better. I can fully recognize that I wish that process was better, but that overall they are an unequivocal good that have done a massive, massive, massive amount of, you know, good in the world. And unfortunately, it's become political where like we again get binary. It's like they're good or evil our team or the other team. Um, and in this case, the WHO became the other team. And because people can make, you know, hay out of it. Uh, and the CDC has sometimes gone that route as well. We got to get past that. Like, you know, there, there are shades of gray. We can have, you know, organizations that do an enormous amount of, of good for the world and yet still can be pointed out for their flaws and do some things better. Uh, but that takes nuance and a, uh, a level of leadership that has sort of been lacking in the United States for, for some time. 
Well, on that note, we're at the end of our hour. Thank you so much for joining us and talking about this today. We will be posting the recording of this to YouTube. So for people joining who um, want to point people to it, feel free. Of course, you can find more of Aaron and his writing and research um, probably, you know, in a day or so. The New York Times will be coming out with something new. You can always um, find him there, follow him on Twitter, looking at his blog or, or YouTube channel that way. But thank you so much, Aaron. Let me mention to everyone, tomorrow is December 1st, and we celebrate World AIDS Day every day on December 1st. I would really, I know there's a lot of stuff all at once, but I really invite people, um, the Arnold Institute for Global Health, we're hosting a special virtual event for Mount Sinai and beyond tomorrow in honor of World AIDS Day. We're focusing on ending the HIV epidemic for the world's children. And in a quick foreshadowing, we'll say like this pandemic is um, in its secondary effects, ravaging families and children living with HIV around the world as they try to cope um, with what it looks like to you know, survive these lockdowns and changes in places that don't have the kind of privilege that we're talking about as well. So we'd love to have people join us at 9 a.m. If you want to stay um, on, uh, on this link for another uh, two minutes, we do have a little promo video that will tell you about what we're going to talk about tomorrow. And also we're, we're asking people to consider supporting some of the urgent needs of adolescents who are living with HIV in Kenya as part of that. But again, thank you so much to Erin. And we uh, hope uh, that maybe in a year we can uh, come back and do this again and we'll like be like, oh, we have nothing pandemic wise to talk about who knows that would be nice <laughs> yeah i'd love to talk about something else but for now yep. we really appreciate this so thank you so much to for you thanks anytime and for those who want to stay on again i'll go ahead and show our quick promo video and then we uh, hope some of you will join us again tomorrow as well The Mount Sinai World AIDS Day event is a celebration for our community to have a way to honor those living with HIV globally. And we directly support youth who are living with HIV in Kenya. My name is Dr. Rachel Freeman. I am a pediatrician and an HIV researcher, and I specialize in caring for children and adolescents who are living with HIV in some of the world's poorest places. When I think about global health and I think about HIV, I really think about the stories of the children I care for in Kenya. I think of stories like Peter's story. When Peter first found out that he had HIV, he thought all hope for the future was lost. He was 13, his father had already died from HIV the year before, and Peter had been infected by his mother at birth. Peter thought that HIV meant the end of his story. And this year, COVID-19 is making the challenges that adolescents like Peter and his family face even more daunting. Many families no longer have any income. Many do not have a secure place to live and they're in desperate need of food. And that makes it even harder to figure out challenges like finding PPE or having access to your medicines for HIV. We want to help children and youth living with HIV know that this infection is not the end of their story. In Kenya, I work with a program called AMPATH that was born out of a partnership between Mount Sinai, Moy University in Kenya, and a number of other North American medical schools. AMPATH is one of the world's largest single HIV treatment programs, and through this partnership in Kenya, we provide HIV care to 15,000 children and adolescents and 150,000 adults who are living with HIV. If you talk to Peter today, he'll tell you that he found hope in a support group at his clinic that was for other kids and youth just like him. He said, this group became my family. It was the only place where people understood the burden that I was carrying. It was the only place where I had friends who believed that I could go far. And as the COVID-19 pandemic has spread, we've been struggling to find ways to offer these kinds of support groups and other support virtually to our kids with HIV. We've also lost the funding to keep counselors in the HIV clinics. Kids like Peter need support services, counselors, peer support groups, safe places and fun places where they can connect with other children who are just like them. 
they need this now more than ever. And they need this virtually and in person. They need support as they grow up so that they can understand that HIV is not the end of their story. To make this kind of change happen, we need partners to join with us and to stand with kids like Peter. We need a community that's going to stand and support and partnership with kids and youth who are living with HIV. Please donate today to help families with children living with HIV. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Again, we hope that some of you might uh, join us again tomorrow. We'll start at 9 a.m. We have a guest from the World Health Organization who leads adolescent HIV work uh, for the World Health Organization. And we're also gonna be talking about HIV care uh, for families, youth, and people in New York City as well. So thank you and thanks for joining us today.